Good morning, church. They've given us the thumbs up, so we're ready to go. If you guys are ready to go. <laughs> Our first song is uh, God is so good. I love this song. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. He cares for me. He cares for me. He cares for me. He's so good to me. I love him so. I love him so. I love him so. He's so good to me. He answers prayer. He answers prayer. He answers prayer. He's so good to me. Good morning, church family. Thank you, Brother Neil, for leading our song this morning. Um, <clears throat> if you're visiting with us today, you are our guest. In your front pew in front of you, you will find a, a, um, a thing of it. It says three cards on here. We have a prayer request that if you have a prayer, uh, you can write your prayer down and then pass it, turn it to the collection plate or leave it on the pew and it will be picked up after services. We have a pink one is for encouragement. Um, you can fill that out. To, to it says to, to David Gustafson. And it says from anyone, any one of you. That's my name, but that's. If you have a, somebody in the congregation that done something for you, you want to encourage them, fill it out and leave it in the pew or pass it to the collection plate. If you're visiting with us and a member, we have a card here also. If you could fill that out for your information, just so we have a record of, of you being here this morning. If you're watching online with us, we, you are welcome as well. We thank you for turning in to us this morning. Um, upcoming this Thursday, how many of you have set up your Christmas tree? Yeah. How many of you set up your Christmas tree? I see like 10 hands. There's a problem here. I know it's just past Thanksgiving. I, I'll give you that out, but I love Christmas. So we have our tree set up. But this Thursday, I'm saying this for this reason. This Thursday, ladies, don't miss this year's ornament exchange party this Thursday, evening at 6.30, here at the Fellowship Hall. There's a sign-up sheet down there or down this hall as well. I know it will be a fun evening. They have other things planned for it as well. But it's an ornament exchange party. I say that because we all have that favorite tree, right? Just say yes. And we all have our special ornaments, right? Some ornaments mean something special to you. When you set up the family tree and you put that one ornament on there that somebody gave you many, many, many years ago, it has some value to it, right? It means something. You enjoy putting that on the tree because it brings back the memories of whoever gave it to you or the circumstances of it being given to you. Well, this is an exchange party. So you take an ornament there and somebody will give you one. 
And it's one of those valuable things that you'll cherish for years and years, hopefully. So it's a great deal, right? It's a great party. So if you haven't signed up, please sign up. If you have any questions, talk to one of the elder's wives, which is Patty, Sue, Laura Lee, Carol, Gladys, Kathy, or Kim. That's a pretty good announcement. My wife told me to say that. <laughs> no, it's, it is a great thing to do. So please take advantage of that, that Thursday night, this Thursday night at 630 in the fellowship hall. I have call to worship. I want to go to Psalms 100. It says this. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. How many of you wake up in the morning with a song on your heart? Especially a Sunday morning. I do that. It just brings joy to you. It just makes a smile on your face. And who doesn't want to see a smile on your face? Right? There's enough frowns going on in the world. We need to have smiles on our face. And yes, this is a tough time of the year. We have lost a lot of loved ones this year. It's been a tough, tough year. And so I understand that. I understand that. But a smile brings cheerfulness and gladness and happiness to somebody you might not even know it brings, brings that to. They could be going through the worst day of their life and a smile and a cheerful shake, handshake or even, even a hug brings joy to them. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. I love that. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Ever feel like you're alone? Ever feel like you're by yourself? The world's coming in on you? You're not by yourself. You're his. You're his. You belong to somebody. Let's remember that. Verse 4, Into his ga gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. Amen. His faithfulness continues throughout all generations. Amen. Let's go to God in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you. Thank you for taking care of us, watching over us. We are your sheep. You have given us what we need. Lord, we, we are thankful. But we are also sad. We, we are hurting in our heart because of lost loved ones that we cherish so much during this time. Holidays and stuff, the time we can get together. And they're not with us. And we are hurting because of it. But Lord, we are thankful. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for the time we can have with our family. Thank you for brothers and sisters who have helped us along the way during those tough times. That give us a smile. That give us a hug. That give us an encouragement card. That look out for us. We are thankful for that. Lord, we're thankful for Jesus Christ. His love that endures forever. We are thankful for that. We are thankful for the seasons we have. We thank you for the nature which we can see God in. We can see your holy hands have provided for us. We can see it. And we are thankful for that. Father, we pray for your return. And this is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Dave, I started in the grocery business back in 1972, and a week before Halloween, we would get 10 cases of candy, nothing after that. Two weeks before Thanksgiving, we would get yams and pumpkin, and then Christmas, we'd get two weeks before that, we'd get the Christmas candy. Last year, I was with Dylan's. October 1st, we'd have 15, case, 15 pallets of candy in the back room. 
And it was from then all the way to the end of the year. You got, you got kind of tired of that after a while. But uh, To God Be the Glory is our next song, first and third verse. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life in atonement of sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Great things he hath taught us, Great things he hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport, when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the Glory, great things he hath done. Song for communion is, uh, Why Did My Savior Come to Earth? Why did my Savior come to earth and to the hum? Go. Why did he choose a lowly birth? Because he loved me so. He loved me so. He loved me so. life for me, for me, because he loved me so. Till Jesus come, I'll sing his praise, and then to glory go, and reign with him through endless days because he loved me so he loved me so he loved me so he gave his precious life for me, for me, because he loved me so.
In first Cor in first Corinthians eleven, starting in twenty three. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus came die for each one of us for our sins and he asks us to remember him will you pray with me please our heavenly father thank you so much for sending Jesus to be our savior and to take away our sins so we can be with you in eternity Please help us to remember all that he has done for us and what a great blessing that is. Be with us now as we take this bread, which represents his body, given in our stead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Then Paul continues, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This blood is the new covenant in his blood. I didn't say that right. This grape juice <laughs> is the new covenant in his blood. Let's remember him now. Will you pray with me, please? Our Heavenly Father, thank you for remembering us and loving us and sending Jesus to bring us home to be with you. Help us to take this now and remember him in accordance with your will. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is the time now set aside to collect our offering. And it will be passed from the back. Will you pray with me, please? Our Heavenly Father, we live in such a time and such a country that we have so many things to thank you for, so many things that the rest of the world can only dream about. Please help us now to return to you the best of what you have given us. Help us to open our hearts and our minds as we give to you. Thank you for this time and the ability to give. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Be with me, Lord. Be with me, Lord. I cannot live without Thee. I dare not try to take one step alone. I cannot bear the loads of life unaided. I need thy strength to lean myself upon. Be with me, Lord, when loneliness takes me, when I must weep amid the fires of plain. And when shall come the hour of my departure for worlds unknown? O Lord, be with me then. Let's stand as the little ones get to run the Bible, or would not run the Bible class, but go to Bible class. We'll sing, uh, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. The song before uh, Wayne's lesson today is uh, Hallelujah, Praise Jehovah. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah, from the heavens praise his name. Praise Jehovah in the highest, all his angels praise proclaim. All his hosts together praise him, sun and moon and stars on high. Praise him, O ye have of heavens, and ye floods above the sky. Let them pray, says give Jehovah, for his name alone is high, and his glory he is exalted, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. Let them praises give Jehovah. They were made at his command. Then forever he established his decree shall never stand. From the earth, oh, praise Jehovah. All ye floods, ye dragons all. Fire and hail and snow and vapors, stormy winds that hear him call. Let them pray, 
Jesus give Jehovah, for his name alone is high, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted. Far above the earth and sky. All you fruitful trees and cedars, all you hills and mountains high, creepy things and beasts and cattle, birds that in the heavens fly, kings of earth and all ye people, princes, great earth judges all. Praise his name, young men and maidens, aged men, and children small. Let them praise his gift Jehovah, for his name alone is high, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. You may be seated. Wayne was going to have me read Psalms 119, but then he wouldn't have any time for <laughs> sermon. So we're just reading Isaiah 42, 5 through 9. Isaiah 42, starting verse 5. This is what God the Lord says, the creator of heavens, who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all the, with all the springs from it who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. The Lord have called you in righteousness, and I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you, and I will make you to be a covenant for the people and for a light for the Gentiles, to open the eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. See the former things that I have taken place, the new things I declare before them spring into being, and I will announce them to you. Well, good morning, Eastwood family. I have a warm welcome for each and every one of you, warm welcome for all of our guests, but most importantly, we have come together to praise the Lord this morning, amen? amen. For where tw two or three gather together in my name, Jesus said, I am there amongst them. The church is the temple of God. So we come together, the Lord is with us, and so we have much to be thankful for. I know this is a busy time of the year. I know I, I heard on the news just the other day that it's probably the second busiest travel day. And so I know there's a lot of folks that are gone, but we also have several guests here and some that we haven't seen in, in a while. So just be sure to take some time today to say hello, to introduce, to uh, love one another. I want to start here today. Um, I, I looked up, uh, on, on my computer and came across this thread about, you know, kind of a funny story about, you know, mispronunciation of names. And so the guy calls uh, PayPal, and uh, PayPal says, you know, hey, welcome to PayPal. Um, can I have your first and last name? And so the guy says, my name is uh, Sagar Patel. And so the uh, guy says, all right, um, uh, Sagar, and he's like, no, it's Sagar. 
He's like, Sag R? He said, no, just hold on for a second. Just call me Batman. And he's like, sir, we have to have your first and last name. And he says, okay, let's go with Bruce Wayne. All right? Um, <laughs> names are important. And as you read through the Bible, it really jumps out of how important a person's name is because it reflects so much about their character. I love every time that I read about Nabal and his wife Abigail. Nabal means fool. And his wife Abigail says he's just like his name. His name means fool. All right, so his name was descriptive of his character. But we can look over in the New Testament where it talks about Thomas. Well, in John's Gospel, three times it, it talks about Thomas, also known as Didymus. What does Didymus mean? It means twin. He was a twin. Notice how that name reflects his character attributes. And so in many ways, a person's name really reflected who they were. So if they went through a dramatic change in life, it's not a surprise for us to see their name being changed in the Bible. Remember, Abram becomes Abraham. Jacob, that trickster, that heel grabber, becomes Israel, he who struggles with God and overcomes. Same way with Saul of Tarsus becomes Paul. Simon uh, Bar-Jonah, Simon son of Jonah, becomes Peter Rock. Why? Because the name defines the person and their character. We started last week, if you happen to be with us, a, a study about the names of God. And hopefully our, our goal is to see these names of God really reveal different attributes and characteristics of God. No, we'll never get them all fully figured out. We'll just do a handful of them as we finish up the end of this year, Lord willing. But I hope to understand a little bit more about God. I hope the study that we go through together helps deepen our faith in God, our trust in God, our love, our devotion, and a desire to serve God, especially as we start upon a new year here in just a few short weeks. I'd like to begin with just a little review of the name we looked at last week. Here's the first name of God mentioned in the Bible. It's Elohim. Elohim, El means powerful or mighty. Him is plural. So he's the mighty, he's the powerful creator God. In the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. And so he is the powerful creator God who created all of the universe and created this planet that you and I lived on, live on. And he created us to be created in his likeness and in his image. Now this amazing, powerful creator God is able to take the chaos of this world and create something so very beautiful at it. And he can take the chaos that mankind, Adam and Eve, found themselves in, in the garden, paradise lost, and this powerful creator God, Elohim, has a plan to see that paradise is restored by the time we get to Revelation chapter 21. Now today, I want to introduce us to another name of God. Now Elohim is used, what, about 2,600 times in the Old Testament. Let me share with you the name that's used 6,519 times in the Old Testament. And it's the name Jehovah or Yahweh. Now, many of the names of God that we're talking about are generic names, generic nouns. This name Jehovah, Yahweh, is his personal name that he reveals, uh, first of all, to Moses. And it's been used over 6,000 times in the Old Testament. This is his personal name that he has revealed. How sad it is. That Jews, I love that laughter that's taking place over here. I love uh, that the Jews, um, are at, in, in Jesus' time, that they had taken that name and discontinued using it. They were worried that they would be using it in an improper way. And it came from this particular scripture. Leviticus 24, verse 16. Here's what scribes did with this verse. And he that blasphemeth the name of Jehovah, he shall surely be put to death. And all the congregation shall certainly stone him, as well as the sojourner, as the homeborn. When he blasphemeth the name of Jehovah, he shall be put to death. 
Now, they wanted to make sure that they did not blaspheme the name of God, Jehovah or Yahweh, but they had taken it too far. And there's a lot of things we see happen in the Bible. It starts off as a good idea, but over time, over the centuries, it becomes a tradition and it gets away from the original purpose. And so the commandment is don't blaspheme the name of God. Don't use his name in inappropriate ways. Don't use it as a curse word. Don't misuse, don't tear down his name. It doesn't say don't use his name. He uses his name over 6,000 times in the Old Testament. We can look in archaeology and even the enemies of Israel use that name Yahweh or Jehovah. So he wants his name to be used, but he wants it to be used in a proper way. Well, let's see this introduction to God's name. Go with me to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3 this morning. We got to go a little ways back in the life of Moses. Once we remember early on, the Pharaoh had given the edict that any of these Jewish baby boys uh, were to be killed when they were born or thrown into the Nile River to die. Now, Moses was rescued. His mother had, after about three months, put him in a little basket, a little ark, put it there in the Nile River, and Pharaoh's own daughter, she was down there baby, heard this little baby, had her servant girl come pick up this basket, open it up, hey, this is one of these little Hebrew babies. She adopts him. He gets raised as a prince of Egypt for 40 years of his life. Now, as a prince of Egypt, he would have been raised as a royal person would. He would experience all that. He would have had a first-class education, being raised, you know, with these royal people. Most of us don't realize this, but he would have had a, a, a strong military foundation as well. Because remember, the pharaohs or the kings, they were supposed to lead their armies into battle. They were to be the commanders in chief. And so, as we read from the um, the historian Josephus, he talks about Moses being a general that had repelled an Ethiopian invasion during his time. And so see um, Moses this morning in these early years of his life, he's like a General MacArthur. He's like a Norman Schwarzkopf, you know, in his time and in his day. That was Moses. That was his experience. But his life changed dramatically one day. That he saw an Egyptian beating a fellow Hebrew. He looked this way, looked another way, didn't think anybody was around, and he killed that Egyptian and buried him in the sand. Now the very next day, he saw a couple of his uh, Jewish brothers fighting with one another. And he goes to break them up. And you know what one of them says? Who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking about killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Oh no, somebody must have seen. The word has been out. Pharaoh gets word of this. He gives the order to have Moses kill. Double rejection. He's being rejected by his adopted family, the Egyptians. He's being rejected by his own ethnic people, the Jewish people. So what does Moses do? He flees Egypt. He goes out into Midian, think of the Arabian Peninsula, and becomes a shepherd there for 40 years. 40 years, raised as a prince of Egypt. Now, 40 years, he's going to be living as a shepherd out in the desert. And here's where God's amazing assignment comes to him. Let's start reading. Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why does the bush not burn up? When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you're standing is on holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, 
the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. So here he is, shepherd, seeing the same old sheep year after year, going through the same areas. Remember, 40 years of doing this. Decade after decade, same terrain, same migration patterns. I've got it down. Nothing new. Pretty boring life. All of a sudden, he sees this bush that's on fire, but it's not burning up, and he goes to check it out. And all of a sudden, God speaks to him. Moses, Moses, take off your sandals. You're standing on holy ground. And Moses does what any of us would do. He fell on the ground and hit his face. He didn't want, did not want to look at God. You ever found yourself in a difficult spot? Let's say between a rock and in a hard place. Or you're out on a limb, and it seems like somebody's starting to cut off that limb, and you're out on the far edge. Maybe it's something that you or I did, and now we're experiencing the consequences of it. Or Moses hadn't done anything wrong at this juncture in his life. I mean, this situation just came before him out of nowhere. What is he going to do? You ever found yourself in a difficult, difficult situation? Seems like if I go to the right, I've got trouble over here. If I go to the left, I've got issues here. If I just keep trying to plow forward, all this is coming down on me. No matter what I do, what I say, it's a, this is just a difficult situation to deal with. Here's something I'd like for all of us to think about this morning. When well, it seems like there's no place to turn, how am I going to handle the situation that I find myself in? That is a great opportunity for us to draw close to God. Keep your spot over here in Exodus chapter 3, but I want to read a verse out of 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul found himself in a, an extremely difficult situation. In fact, I'll show it to you on the big screen. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 through 11. Now, scholars are divided on exactly what was the situation that he was finding. He doesn't reveal all of it. We just know that it was tough. Look what he says in verse 8. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardship. Okay, he's going through hardship. We suffered in the, in, in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, our hearts, we felt the sentence of death. But this happened, that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from our deadly peril, and he will deliver us on him. We have set our hopes that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted to us in the answer to the prayers of many. Now, Paul again found himself in a very difficult situation. That they were suffering. They were under persecution. They felt the sentence of death. But he said, notice how he said that this actually ended up being a benefit for him. Verse 9, this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God to deliver them from the deadly peril they were facing. And the prayers of the Corinthians helped deliver them from the suffering that they were going through. You find yourself flat on your back. You can't help but look up. And when you look up, maybe that reminds you that God has this. And that's a reminder of the name of God, isn't it? We studied about Elohim last week. He is the God that has all power, all might. And he's got the situation under control. And so a lot of times when we face these different difficult circumstances in life, it's an opportunity for us to learn something about God. You're like me, it's easy to get kind of busy, caught up in the world, doing this, doing that, uh, getting with these people, getting with this group, and almost I can get so busy that I don't have time to really think about God. But sometimes there's circumstances we find ourselves in that I am forced to lay on my back and think about God, and here's a great time for God to reveal something about himself to me. Or secondly, God might be trying to pull something out of us that's in us but if it wasn't for this circumstance, it would still be residing inside of us. It's amazing how I've seen some people over the years, maybe they're kind of naturally quiet and timid and shy, but because of the circumstance that they find themselves in, all of a sudden they got a strength and a reserve 
about them that they would not have had if they hadn't gone through this experience. Other people may have been really struggling with bragging and pride in their life, but it seems like these difficult waves of life have knocked off that toughness, that arrogance, and pride. And now at their 40s, their 50s, their 60s, and their 70s, there is a great humility about them. Or others that might have struggled with forgiving other people, but because of the circumstances that they find themselves in, here's a tremendous opportunity for God to help mine this forgiveness out of me, this compassion and this mercy. And it wasn't until this experience, whether I brought it upon myself or it just falls into my lap, here's what I get to deal with. It's opportunity for me to look up to God. What are you revealing to me about yourself? What are you trying to pull out of my self, Father, that I don't have yet, but you're helping to develop, you're helping to mind, you're helping to purge that out of me. Now, let's go back to Exodus chapter 3 and see Moses' what I call his mission impossible assignment. Now, many of us are old enough to remember that old uh, television show, Mission Impossible, and the main character was named Jim, and he would tell him, here's this incredible assignment, and if you're not able to pull it off, we're going to deny it, but you, if you do accept this assignment, you know, um, this tape is going to self-destruct in five seconds. Now, most of our younger folks kind of think of Mission Impossible movies with Tom Cruise, all six of those movies. Well, look at Moses' Mission Impossible assignment as it's revealed starting in verse number 7. Then the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and, because, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites have reached me, and I've seen the way that the Egyptians are pressing them. So now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, uh, to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Verse 11. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. So here's his mission impossible. Shepherd, out in the wilderness, 40 years. Moses, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to Pharaoh. You need to tell him, God has said, uh, we need to take the Israelites out of Egypt. Moses has a few questions for God at this time. First of all, who am I? I'm a nobody. I'm, I'm a shepherd. Why would you call someone like me to do this? God reassures him. He says that he'll be with him. Here's a sign. You will come with the people and you will worship at this mountain, Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb. That's going to be a sign for you. Here's the second thing. What is your name? Notice what he says in verse 13. Moses says to God, Now suppose I go to the Israelites and I say to them, The God of your father has sent me to you. And they ask, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? Now by this time, the Israelites have come to believe in all kinds of other gods. And you think about the Egyptians. They had a multiplicity of gods. They had the sun god. They had Ra, they had the frog god, his name was Heck. They had Anubis, that was the god of the dead. So they have, after 400 years of this influence, the Israelites themselves have come to believe in all these gods. It's going to take about a thousand years for that idolatry to be pur uh, purged out of the Israelite people. All right, so if I go to them and say, God has told me, they're going to ask, well, what god? What is his name? And so God gives them the answer. Notice this in verse 14 and 15. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you're to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. 
God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. So he tells them, here is my name. Here is my name. I am who I am. Or if you're reading from the American Standard, it says, I am that I am. And then in verse 15, it talks about the Lord, capital L-O-R-D. Or again, if you're reading from the American Standard, it actually uses the word Jehovah there. So there's two names that we need to be familiar with here. One is in the verb form, I am. In the Hebrew, hayah. No, not the karate kind, but that's how you would kind of say it. I am. And then he uses this other word here, Lord, capital L-O-R-D. In the, in the Hebrew language, Y-H-W-H. Uh, American Standard will use the word Jehovah. Holman will actually use the word Yahweh here. All right, so that's his official name. I am Jehovah, Yahweh, Y-H-W-H. That's the way that we can kind of in, uh, interpret that in English is I am. I'm just present tense. I have always been here. I am the eternal creator God. My name is Jehovah. My name is Yahweh. You could call me I am. I'm the self-existing one. Now, a little history on how did this word Jehovah come about. So we take these four letters, Y-H-W-H, because the Hebrew language actually writes in consonants. Now, remember, as I said earlier at this lesson, they were really concerned about mispronouncing the name of God. They didn't want to be uh, accused of blaspheming God's name. So the scribes thought, hey, let's get a little clever here. Let's take another word that's used of God, and that's the word Adonai. Take some of the vowel sounds out of that and plug that in to Y-H-W-H. And you get the, the term Yehovah. Well, you put that in Latin, that Y becomes a J, and so we get the term Jehovah. So Jehovah, Yehovah, or Yahweh. That is kind of God's name that he's revealed over 6,000 times in the Old Testament. Now, Let's compare the two. God as Elohim and God as Jehovah here this morning. Elohim, again, the powerful, mighty creator God. Now, Jehovah, that's his personal name because God wants to be personal with his creation. Now, I want to show you something. Go all the way to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2 here uh, this morning with me. Now, in chapter 1, we, we got introduced to that first name of God, Elohim. Notice what Moses recorded in Genesis chapter 2. Verse 4, this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. Now, when the Lord God, oh, with that ought to catch our attention, Lord, that's Yahweh or Jehovah. God Elohim. So when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, then you go down to verse 7. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and, the bre and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Verse 8. Now the Lord God planted the garden in the east in Eden. Verse 9. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground. Verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to care for it. Verse 18, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Verse 19, the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. And then in verse 20, or 21, then the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took up one of man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh, and then the Lord God made a woman from the rib that he had taken out of the man and brought her to the man. So here we see Elohim, the powerful creator God, but then also Jehovah God, the personal covenant-keeping God 
work very closely and very intimately with his creation, and especially those that are created in his image and his likeness, as Jehovah God provides all that humanity needs by providing these relationships for him. That ought to tell us a lot about God, is that God wants to have a personal relationship with us. Now, let me just read this verse out of Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10 through 12, just to say, here's how personal God wants to get with his people. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10 through 12, listen to this. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. Remember, the church is the house of Israel, as we read about in the New Testament. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I'll put my laws in their minds. I'll write them on their hearts. I will be their God. They will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. So if you're part of this new covenant relationship with God, they won't have to be taught about knowing God. You will already know God. You will know his word. You will know who he is. You will know who his son Jesus Christ is. You will know the gospel story and how I'm supposed to respond to that. And so we can become part of that covenant, having God's word written on our mind and on our hearts, and that we will have our sins forgiven and we'll remember our wickedness no more because we know the Lord. We're part of that covenant. Well, how can we get to know Jehovah God better? That's a couple good questions. Number one, I think it would be helpful if we would spend time alone with him. Isn't that something that we, as you read through the Gospels, we see Jesus do on a regular basis? That he kind of just takes some time just to get alone, to be with his Father. It might be early in the morning. It might be uh, staying up all night, praying about a situation. Just having some alone time with God. Now maybe like some of you, you got to see some of your family members over this Thanksgiving holiday. Um, seeing our kiddos kind of reminded me of a situation. I remember when one of our boys was going to Oklahoma Christian, he said one of their Bible classes that they had, uh, there that, the, that their professor encouraged them to take 10 minutes alone to be with God each and every day. And he said that was such a blessing for his life. And I believe that's a blessing for each and every one of our life. Whether you're a morning person or you're a late night owl, just to get your Bible out, to read some scripture, to take time to talk to God in prayer, just to have some alone time with him. That will really be a blessing for your life. Secondly, I'm encouraged as I look at uh, Moses was not satisfied just with his relationship with God. He wanted that relationship to grow. He realized that God knew a lot about him. He knew his name. He knew where he was. He knew the assignment that he wanted to give to Moses. And Moses wanted to know some more things. He, he wanted God to answer some questions for him. He wanted to know what his name was. He wasn't satisfied as just knowing him as Elohim, as Elohim, just as a powerful creator God. He wanted to know him personally. He wanted to know him as Jehovah God. You know, I pray that's our attitude here today. Because it's easy to kind of find ourselves to say, you know what, I've read quite a few Bible passages. Maybe I've you know, memorize a few verses here and there or over the years. Maybe I taught a class. Maybe I went on a mission trip. Maybe I was kind of involved in a, in, a, in a ministry at a time. Or maybe I was part of a small group or led a small group or something. It's easy to get caught in the past. But you see, in our relationships, they need to be managed today and they need to be planned for in the future. The same can be said for our relationship with God. I can't rely upon the things that I've done in the past. I've got to be living in the presence with an anticipation towards the future. Again, as I mentioned at the beginning of today's lesson, we are making some thoughts and plans, prayerful plans about the new year, 2023, if it's the Lord will that we're still all here. And we need to be thinking about where is my relationship with God? Am I content just being where I'm at? Just kind of satisfied. I put in my time in the past. I, I just need to kind of retire and rest on my laurels and just kind of ease along in life. Or do I want to have that Moses spirit? Says, you know what? I might get involved in a new ministry. I might want to start attending church just a little more often. 
Or maybe there's some folks in the church I just want to really serve and minister to in a special way. Or maybe I've been so busy and so distracted, I just really need to get back to those daily quiet times, those devotional times with God. See, that's what this, this lesson about learning more about God and His name and how He wants to have a personal relationship with me ought to motivate me in the present and where I'm going in the future. Yes, He is Elohim. He is the powerful Creator God. But his personal name that he's revealed because he wants to be personal with every one of us is Yahweh or Jehovah or the Lord. So we're going to offer the invitation here this morning. Brother Neil has a song picked out. If anybody needs a response, won't you come and do that as we stand and sing this invitation song. He gave me a song. He took my burdens all away Up to the brighter day He gave me a song A wonderful song A wonderful song I now can sing In my heart joy bells ring He gave me a song A wonderful song He gave me a song to sing, to sing about, he lifted me from sin and doubt. Oh, praise his name, he is my king. A wonderful song, he is to me. I am redeemed, no more to die, never to say goodbye. He gave me a song, a wonderful song, a wonderful song. in that fair land, sing with the chorus, friend. He gave me a song, a wonderful song. Gave me, gave me a song to sing about. Sing about. He, lifted he lifted me from sin and doubt. Oh, praise, oh, praise his, his name. name. He is my king. Is my king. A, wonderful a wonderful song. He is to me. For our closing prayer, I'd like to put in your minds a Bob and Grace uh, Lampkin talked to me this morning, and they had just driven back from Pueblo, Colorado, uh, from Thanksgiving, and they just got back, and then they got a notice that her father had a heart attack. So they're heading out to uh, Pueblo. Let's keep them in our prayers. And Wayne mentioned about all the people that are struggling and how God can help them. So in our prayers, let's remember the people. We all have people we know that are struggling, that we can share. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we're so truly grateful that we can come before you, honor your name, fall on our knees and just thank you for everything you've done. What a wonderful week that we can take some time out to, <clears throat> especially just say thank you for all the blessings that you give to us. Be with us now. We know that there are so many that are struggling, and we know that we have the answer. We have the opportunity to share with them. So open our hearts and our eyes. Give us the opportunity to share your word with them, to comfort them, just to be a Christian friend to them that are struggling to let them know that there's, there is help. We just thank you for this opportunity to come to you in prayer. We just thank you that, uh, for the lesson that we've had and op open our hearts and, again, open our eyes that we can reach out to others. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
those parents that need to go get their kids, they can leave now, and we'll sing uh, one verse of uh, Count Your Many Blessings. When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one, count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. We are dismissed. <laughs>